All right, thanks everybody. Uh, so I am going to uh, talk to you this morning about your amazing Great Lakes. Um, I am Titus Seilheimer. I'm a fishery specialist with Wisconsin Sea Grant. Um, today actually is my ninth anniversary with Wisconsin Sea Grant. So um, I have uh, been here based in Manitowoc doing a lot of work uh, over the years. Um, you know, it sounds like you've had a, a series of, of great speakers. So this may just be review, but I always like to just kind of uh, plug what Sea Grant is. Um, Wisconsin Sea Grant is one of 34 uh, Sea Grant programs. And uh, you know, you can tell from the map, looking around on this map, uh, this is a coastal program. It's a partnership between uh, the federal government through NOAA and states uh, on the coast. And so that includes Wisconsin. Uh, we're also celebrating 50 years um, of Wisconsin Sea Grant um, as a uh, Sea Grant program. So uh, that is coming up next year. Uh, so if you want to follow along, uh, you know we're going to have lots of uh, lots of interesting history. I think coming up um, over 2022. Uh, and the little inset map there is just sort of our locations. We are based out of UW Madison, but uh, we have. Uh, we have a presence on the coast. So I am the Manitowoc dot there. Um, you know, we live in our coastal communities at our field offices. Um, each of those field offices has different specialties. So the specialist based there, uh, you've heard from Deidre already. Uh, she's based in Milwaukee, I'm in Manitowoc. Uh, my colleague, Julia Nordyke is in Green Bay. We've got a, a field office up in Superior where Natalie Chin is our, uh, our climate change and tourism specialist. Um, what we do at Sea Grant though, we do three things. And I like, I like this graph as well, because this really kind of encapsulates what my job has uh, sort of developed into over uh, these nine years. Um, extension, education, and research. Those are the kind of three, the three legs on the stool uh, that is Sea Grant. Um, and then our focus areas, these are broad kind of focus areas that are throughout the Sea Grant program. So, um, you know, sustainable fisheries is kind of my home as a fishery specialist. But if you think, you know, what's important to fisheries, well, healthy coastal ecosystems, uh, resilient communities and economies, workforce development, literacy, I mean, all these things are really, uh, really in, you know, inter intermixed and connected. And I think that's why uh, I kind of work in all of these, all of these areas. So we kind of broadly, work in all three uh, sort of legs of the school stool, and then uh, to different degrees, uh, different kind of emphasis on different focus areas. We also fund research. Um, so that is some of the federal dollars that come in that we can fund uh, scientists in Wisconsin to go out and ask the question. So PFAS has already come up, even though I just started. Um, and that is something in the kind of arena of emerging contaminants is definitely on our radar and is definitely something that we are funding research on uh, because it is a big concern. Uh, and, and this is what we're going to talk about today. This is, uh, you know, you know, the Great Lakes, uh, you know, that distinctive shape, but I love this picture. Uh, you know, for one reason, it's it was a clear day across the whole basin, and that's pretty rare. Um, to get this much uh, kind of view, but really, really cool. Um, if you can, you know, you've got Cape Cod over here, you can see, you know, here's the kind of the curvature of the earth. Um, and then just the whole Great Lakes uh, as a resource, as, you know, it's just a, a massive, amazing, globally unique system uh, containing 20% of the surface freshwater um, right, right here, right on kind of our backyard. Um, we are really a coastal region. Um, you know, the Great Lakes alone, just the US side of the Great Lakes has about 4,500 miles of coastline, um, which you can compare that on this map, the Atlantic plus the Gulf and about half of the, uh, the Pacific over here, that's how much coastline we have. So we are a coastal state, we are a coastal region. Um, and you know, I, I think that is always important to remember, even though we're you know, kind of in the Midwest, we are very coastal. And, you know, one of the reasons Sea Grant is here is because these lakes are a lot more like ocean systems than they are inland lakes. Um, if we flip the Great Lakes over on their sides, uh, you can get another perspective of sort of the, the scale of these lakes. 
Um, Lake Superior on the left, this is the, the sort of the headwaters of the system. Water flows out of Lake Superior, it goes downstream into Lake Huron and Lake Michigan, which you can see are kind of overlapping because they share a surface elevation. Uh, water goes out through the St. Clair River, uh, through Lake St. Clair, down the Detroit River and into Lake Erie. Lake Erie is the shallowest of the Great Lakes. It has kind of the, the least water volume. Um, and then Niagara Falls, that Niagara escarpment that we have here in Wisconsin, uh, the other end of that is over here at Niagara Falls. Uh, so the water drops from, you know, over 500 feet elevation down to 243, um, down into Lake Ontario, and then out to the ocean. Uh, a couple different things I like to point out here. The deepest point in Lake Superior, even though it's the top of the chain, is deeper than the deepest part of Lake Ontario, even though Lake Ontario is hundreds of feet lower. So that gives you an idea of just comparatively how deep Lake Superior is. Um, and the other kind of number here is that 55% of all the Great Lakes water is in Lake Superior. The, re the rest, the 45% of the rest of the water divided up among the other four Great Lakes. So uh, that's just uh, you know, a massive amount of fresh water, especially in Lake Superior. Um, so I think history is important to think about, um, you know, the, in terms of like comparing the Great Lakes to other lakes, uh, they are fairly young. Is this a, you know, is this a long history or a short history? Well, like, you know, to us and thinking about our kind of individual lifespans, um, you know, the, the lakes are really old, but compared to other lakes, um, you know, as recently as about 20,000 years ago, at the last glacial uh, maximum, you know, all the Great Lakes were completely covered in ice. Um, so, you know, that kind of gives you this uh, starting point when the ice started recede receding, moving north after 20,000 years ago, that these lakes could develop. So the ecosystems that we have are fairly young. Um, if you compare the Great Lakes to some of the other kind of global Great Lakes, like the African Rift Valley Lakes, uh, Lake Tan Tanzanica, uh, Lake Malawi, for example, those lakes are millions of years old. And so the species diversity of things like fish are, you know, we're, we're in the, the range of thousands of fish, whereas in the Great Lakes, uh, thousands of fish species, uh, compared to the Great Lakes where it's about 180 uh, fish species. So, you know, that sort of history really uh, determines what, what we see in our lakes today. Um, and a, another example here, you know, just taking a look at sort of how dynamically, even in recent time, the lakes have changed, uh, you know, over the last 20,000 years from a very low water period um, back 14,000 years ago, where, you know, much of what is currently underwater was uh, exposed. Uh, you can actually kind of explore some of these areas going up north of two rivers to the buried forest uh, state natural area where uh, in the bluff, uh, there have been these, uh, you know, sort of the evidence of that, this forest that had grown during a low water period that was then covered up again when the water came up. And then you can see these logs, these trees uh, being eroded out of the bluff. Um, there's also high water periods. So times when, you know, here 12,000 years ago, uh, the upper peninsula is underwater and, you know, the Basically, we're looking at this one big lake here. Uh, at this point, uh, water is uh, leaving uh, lakes, what's Lake Superior now through the Brule River um, and down into the St. Croix uh, watershed. Um, and so lots of interesting history happening here. And then you can also see some of these you know, very high water periods in uh, places like the Ridges uh, Preserve up in Bailey's Harbor. Uh, Point Beach and Woodland Dunes Nature Preserve and Two Rivers, where you can see the ridges and swales, which are sort of the old, the uh, swales are the old beach, uh, the ridges are the old kind of dunes, and you can see, you know, this series of old shorelines when the water was much higher. So, you know, even today we can still see kind of the, the footprint of these changes over time. And that is, you know, kind of the, the setting the stage for looking at the, uh, the ecosystem that has developed um, over time. So we've got you know, this time, time series where 
these different habitats can develop and fairly diverse, very interesting habitats that harbor, you know, different aquatic species, depending on, uh, you know, what types of habitats they are. So I'm going to walk through those, uh, take you underwater, give you a look at, you know, what some of these habitats look like. Um, you know, in this picture right now, we're looking at a coastal wetland in Georgian Bay, which is part of Lake Huron on the Canadian side. And that's actually where I did uh, my graduate work, a lot of it. Um, worked up in coastal wetlands studying fish, uh, fish species, and that was sort of my introduction to the Great Lakes science. But what we're going to look at is actually, you know, these, these habitats, these coastal wetlands um, are uh, just sort of, they're, you know, we, we call them the, uh, the rainforests of the, the temperate zone, uh, just in terms of their uh, productivity. They're like coral reefs, they're like rainforests, they are very productive, they're very species rich, um, they're shallow, they're on the, the margin between the terrestrial, the, you know, the upland and the actual Great Lake themselves. Um, and so there's a lot of overlap with fish moving in and out with other species using them, they warm up first, they're important spawning and nursery habitats. And we can, you know, take a jump into these. This is uh, the Mink River Estuary in uh, kind of Northern Door County. Uh, it's uh, now a state natural area, and you can, you know, just as as we pan through this area, you can see the diversity of different species here. That's uh, Vallisneria. You've got a school of uh, shiners going by. There's some uh, uh, macroalgae on the bottom. There's some pondweed, um, and you know, I think when you really get to see what what the lakes are like, what these habitats are like underwater, you really see the you know sort of the rich diversity. It is like uh, you know, going into a forest and seeing all the different heights of species, the different shapes of things, uh, you know, different plants, different shrubs, different trees. Well, it's just like that underwater as well. Um, this is also the Mink River Estuary. We're just closer out to uh, Lake Michigan. So uh, the water's clearer uh, because we have much clearer water in Lake Michigan compared to the, the estuary Mink River uh, runoff. Um, and I'm going to just I'm gonna run that one again. This is a wavy day. You can just see kind of this uh, movement of the, the plants. You can see algae growing on uh, the surface of some of these. Uh, there's some pond weeds here. Uh, there's some of that uh, macroalgae growing down on the bottom. Um, and you know, just that diversity, this is habitat. This is, we've got invertebrates living on here. We've got fish moving in. You know, if you're a baby fish, this is a great place to be. It's, it's got places to hide. It's got lots of food. Um, so that is, you know, what we look at in terms of habitat here. Uh, we also have the rivers and streams. You know, these are sort of the original connections between the Great Lake and the, the, the watersheds, the headwaters. Um, you know, these are pathways that people have used, but they're also pathways that uh, fish use um, or live in year round. Um, we can take a look here. This is uh, just a look at uh, uh, stream right next to my office here in Manitowoc, the Silver Creek, and uh, spawning uh, white suckers. So, you know, they come in April and May, uh, some of the first fish species, and, and there's that spawning action. You can see, uh, you know, if you look at the rocks on the bottom here, how clean those rocks are, how clean that gravel is, it's because those fish are moving around. Uh, they are, you know, cleaning that off with that very vigorous spawning. and uh, you know, bringing energy from Lake Michigan, where they're living most of the year, and bringing that energy up into uh, into the, the rivers, into these headwaters, because they'll just keep going upstream uh, and carrying that energy and transporting it, and then leaving uh, their reproductive material, those uh, fertilized eggs that grow into, uh, you know, baby suckers, which are then prey for birds and fish and other things. Um, you know, so a really interesting kind of connection between uh, the lake and, and our watersheds. Uh, you know, another kind of charismatic species here, you know it, the, uh, the lake sturgeon. This is in the Wolf River, uh, part of the Lake Winnebago system. But, um, you know, just sort of the, the massive scale of these fish, um, you know, if you, if you think about kind of, you know, over thousands of years, how and, and they're, they're spawning in action, you know, they're just spawning right on the shore. And if you ever get a chance, 
uh, in the spring to head up there. Uh, this is the, the Sturgeon Trail uh, near New London, but you can you know, check with the DNR website on spawning activity, see when it's peaking, head up there and, and you know, you're, you're like five feet away from these fish. It's really amazing. Um, and, you know, this is culturally a really uh, an important resource today because of the, the winter spear fishery out on Lake Winnebago, but also, uh, you know, through history, um, you know, for the, the Native Americans, you know, living along these rivers, uh, you know, it's, it's spring, you've kind of gone through all your food resources, it's kind of a hungry time, and, you know, what appears, but these uh, large migratory fish, uh, suckers, walleyes, sturgeon, that when they're spawning, they're just not too concerned. I mean, you could basically walk down there and pick one up. So, um, you know, a really interesting kind of history and story with, with sturgeon in Wisconsin. Uh, other habitats though, uh, the beaches and the near shore. Uh, you know, I think this is looking at Lake Michigan, especially uh, this very close to shore and beach habitat in terms of fish, not that well studied. Um, I think we generally overlook it just because, uh, you know, the, the larger fish, the sport fish, the commercially harvested fish, they're all, all in deeper waters. Uh, the rivers have different, rivers and harbors have different species. But what is happening in this, you know, margin right on the, the water, that's uh, a lot less science goes into that. But this is also the area where, you know, it's accessible to most people. You don't need any, you know, you don't need a boat. You don't, you just need to get to the beach and you can experience the Great Lake. Um, we have lots of different kind of seasonal use by different species. These, this is just right off the South Pier in Manitowoc. Uh, in the early summer when alewives uh, have come in uh, for spawning, um, you know, I think lots of people know the story of alewives. It's a, a North Atlantic species that uh, came into the Great Lakes through the canal systems uh, and in Lake Michigan especially really, uh, you know, exploded in populations uh, where kind of mid 20th century at their peak, 90% of the fish biomass in Lake Michigan was alewives. Um, they, they have this tendency to die when they come into shore. So there's always this kind of die off in the Great Lakes during their spawning period. And uh, you know when there was billions of pounds, I would assume, uh, there were a lot of dead fish on the lake. Um, you know, those, those population numbers have declined to the point where now uh, kind of management discussions are, well, you know, how do we balance uh, the stock salmon with the invasive, uh, a food source, which is now alewives, um, you know, just so that they can maintain those populations, which is a kind of an interesting uh, discussion uh, to to kind of watch. Uh, other types of habitat. This is uh, you know just heading up to Madeline Island in the Apostles, uh, uh, right offshore. Um, you know, here we've got a rocky habitat, um, large rocks, smaller rocks. Um, and uh, you know, fairly clear water here, although a bit of silt um, stirred up by the wave action. And there's there's a pair, pair of crayfish uh, hanging out there. Uh, hard to hard to spot some fish though. I would you know I'd love to get more fish uh, fish footage here, but um, we're gonna have to settle for crayfish. Uh, and then we can move to the offshore, and that is you know even more so um, you know. If you think about kind of the size of the Great Lakes, most of it is deeper offshore areas that, you know, generally you don't get to see. And, you know, with water, you kind of see the surface. What's happening underneath is, is generally a mystery. Um, and that's kind of contrasting with, with a forest or other type of habitat where you can really see into those habitats. Here, we kind of, unless you dive or snorkel or go in the water, uh, you're not really seeing what, what it's like down there. So. Uh, this is uh, some video that uh, is part of a project that I worked on um, over uh, several years, uh, working with the commercial fishery, riding along on the boats, um, and having the opportunity to count a lot of fish and, and help collect some science uh, information to inform management decisions for this fishery, uh, but also to be able to put uh, a something as simple as a GoPro camera, which is what this is, a uh, camera you can go and buy at the store, 
put it onto this net. We're we're down over a hundred feet here, and what it shows, uh, you know, you can see the net there. We're looking down at the bottom, and you can see the bottom of the lake. That's what Lake Michigan looks like, uh, at least kind of off the Two Rivers area. We've got a uh, you know really sandy bottom here, but those dark patches are kind of a mix of quagga mussels, those invasive mussels that are. Uh, related, fairly closely related to the uh, the zebra mussels and actually uh, very few zebra mussels left. You don't see those, it's all quagga mussels and uh, really the, the distribution of quagga mussels is much greater than zebra mussels ever were in Lake Michigan. Uh, switch to the side view here so we kind of get the feeling for this, this net, but what we're gonna watch for from the right is a big school of Lake Whitefish um, and there they come, they just sort of appear. Um, so this is a schooling fish uh, species. It's uh, whitefish are sort of cousins of the uh, trout and salmon. So they have that adipose fin between their uh, dorsal fin and their tail. Um, and this is, you know, for us in Wisconsin and, and mainly the upper lakes, this is our mainstay of our commercial fishery these days. Uh, for Wisconsin's Lake Michigan commercial harvest, over 90% of our harvest is Lake Whitefish now. Um, you know, really uh, well-managed science-based uh, management there. Uh, harvest is, is allocated by these quotas. Um, and, you know, really uh, sort of an interesting industry uh, to kind of be aware of. And this, uh, you know, just getting an idea of what, what this fishery's like and, um, We'll just kind of hang out a little longer. And this is just at the back of these, this uh, trawling net. This is what, uh, you know, kind of the behavior of the fish. I think, uh, you know, if you've, if you've seen stories or, you know, heard about trawling in general, kind of globally, um, you know, it's, it's a much smaller scale in the Great Lakes and, uh, you know, really kind of an interesting gear in, in Lake Michigan where it's uh, pretty targeted, you know, very, very low bycatch here with other species. And you could just kind of see, you know, the fish are swimming around there. They'll be pulled up and they'll be on your plate. Uh, and it is Friday. So, uh, you know, it's a great day for a white fish fish fry if you can find one. Uh, some other, other views of the bottom. This is uh, from a, a mapping project that happened in uh, the Two Rivers area as part of the process to uh, designate the Wisconsin Shipwreck Coast Natural, National Marine Sanctuary, which was officially designated this year uh, back in August. So this is uh, a federal uh, kind of protected area that uh, NOAA, which is uh, again, where, where Sea Grant is housed nationally, uh, NOAA has these marine sanctuaries that um, in the Great Lakes, at least, there's one in Thunder Bay, Michigan, there's one here now and they focus on the marine resources, uh, the, the kind of maritime heritage, shipwrecks especially. Um, and part of that process was mapping uh, the habitats here. Uh, so they kind of pulled this high grade sonar around, but then they dropped this camera to also get a, a view to kind of verify what the, the sonar uh, said. And this uh, just gives you a kind of a close-up view of, you know, a whole mix of quagga mussels. This green stuff is Cladophora growing, um, and Cladophora is a native algae, but it can become a, a sort of a nuisance when it washes up on the beach. And, you know, winners and losers with invasive species like quagga mussels, uh, Cladophora has definitely benefited with the clearer water. Uh, it's able to grow deeper, and quagga mussels really bring a lot of energy down to the bottom where the that attached algae is. Uh, another look here of uh, quagga mussels just kind of creating these uh, networks in the sand. So that is, you know, that's an overview, I think, of uh, a lot of different habitats ar around the Great Lakes, um, you know, what some of those look like underwater. Now I want to uh, go into some of the, the stories of change uh, that we have in the Great Lakes as well, uh, because they are, you know, just constantly in flux, always changing. Um, and one of the ways we can really look at, uh, you know, the lakes in change as they change is through water levels. Um, 
we have uh, for Lake Michigan, this is our graph on top. This is the, the water level uh, for each year uh, over uh, our, our time period. And we've got over 100 years of really good water level data for Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. Um, and you can see over time, we've got a red line in the middle. That's sort of the long-term average. If we average this whole period out, uh, that's generally where we are. But uh, you know, water goes up, water goes down. Um, and that, uh, that's definitely obvious here. Uh, there's a, about a six foot swing from record low to record high um, in, in recent years. You know, over the, the kind of recent decades, we've had really high record highs back in the, the mid 80s, uh, the late 90s. Uh, and then we had this interesting period here from about 1999 through 2013 of below average water level. Uh, that was then followed by a record high rate of increase um, where the water went, you know, this was our lowest low in 2013 up to nearly record highs uh, right here in 2020. Uh, and that was not a long period of time. So, uh, you know, some interesting, interesting stories that we saw, uh, you know, coming off this low period into this high period, um, I'll show in some pictures coming up. But if you want to get a, a, another kind of view of what this looks like, you know, I can show you a graph, but let's look at some numbers. This is the, the 8th Street Bridge in Manitowoc um, with, uh, you know, this gauge here that is helping boats determine if they can go under the bridge without it opening. Um, so back in March 2013, uh, here's that 10. So, uh, you know, keep an eye on that. Uh, in 2013, that's right here in this low period. Uh, we jump up to 2017, we're up to that six. Um, so that is, you know, right there, that's about four feet of water, water level increase. This is in the Manitowoc Harbor. This water level is determined by the water level of Lake Michigan. Uh, and then up to 2019, you know, with, with even higher water. So we're, you know, about six feet of water difference. Um, you know, that is a, a really profound uh, rapid change. Um, what that looks like on the beach, um, this, is a, this is a beach near campus where I, I'm based and I've spent a lot of time out here. Uh, you know, some of the interesting things you can see, remember that you know, 2000 to 2013 low water period. Well, that allowed um, all these uh, kind of trees and shrubs to grow on, on the beach here. Uh, so you know, we had this kind of line of trees that were about a little over a decade old. Uh, so, you know, 20, 25 foot trees, a lot of cottonwoods, willows um, growing on the beach. And so that's kind of low period. Um, we then jump forward. Um, and as my children grow, so does the water level um, up to here. So in this uh, earlier picture, we were out here, um, uh, right here. The next picture, we're actually standing over here because where we were in that previous picture is underwater now. And you can see a lot of those trees have uh, already washed away. Uh, and then we move up to uh, 2019, uh, and that's a difference of four feet. And you know, basically where we're at now, we are way back here. You can see that kind of permanent shoreline, the bluff line with uh, you know, very adult trees. And that's where we're at. At that high period, there's kind of bluff here and there's Lake Michigan. There's not much for beach. Um, so, uh, not, I'm not saying the cause was my children growing, but, uh, it was, you know, it did reflect that same growth over that same period. Now the water levels are going down. Uh, and I think that's, that's some good, good news. Um, we are, uh, I think from where we were a year of a year ago, December, uh, 2020, we are about 18 inches water level lower than we were, uh, than we are right now. So, uh, you know, that is taking the pressure off. Um, you know, these ups and downs are natural, but uh, for coastal infrastructure, it can really, you know, damage things like piers and docks. Uh, the big January storm, uh, you know, damaged uh, quite a, bit, a lot of millions of dollars of damage down in Milwaukee area. So, um, you know, those are some of the consequences. Uh, I like to, you know, kind of circle back to the beach. Um, you know, the beach is sort of this understudied habitat, but it's also, 
you know, really the, the place that people can, um, you know, readily engage with the lake. You don't need a boat. You don't need, you know, fishing gear. You can just kind of go there and experience the, the water. Um, you know, for us in Wisconsin, it's generally really cold water, but, uh, you know, there are some nice times, a lot of people in the water here um, enjoying it. Um, you know, sort of thinking about our amazing Great Lakes, uh, you know, what do we have things like tides, you know, that's uh, people will, you know, kind of ask about and, you know, tides are caused by the gravitational force of the moon. Um, and, you know, globally in the oceans, there's some places with really big tides, some places with really small tides. Uh, and basically, we don't really have tides that much. Uh, we, you know, it's, it's on the magnitude of, of less than an inch. So we do have, there is some tidal force and really the, probably the one place you might see it uh, is uh, in Green Bay, just because of the, the shape and the, the depth. Uh, it's kind of this long, narrow bay. Um, but what we do have are, uh, you know, one of the reasons you don't go out and see, uh, uh, you know, evidences of the tide is because kind of the larger forces of things like wind. Uh, what we do have are seiches, um, and you can see this kind of animated seiche here. And what a, what a seiche is, when you get long periods of uh, sustained winds in a single direction, uh, the wind pushes the water uh, to the other side of the lake in the direction it's blowing. That's called the setup. Uh, they're set down on this side. And so you can actually see that. Um, you can see this, you know, water levels increasing or decreasing at a local scale due to wind. Um, and then, you know, I think what's interesting is you can then watch when that wind changes direction or stops blowing, you actually see it slosh back and forth. So it's like getting into a bathtub and the water sloshes on the sides. Well, it's the same thing, except it's Lake Michigan. Lake Michigan's that bathtub and the water sloshes back and forth. And uh, you know, sometimes you can see that on, on the beach, you can see the water kind of moving up, moving down, even though it's not kind of a windy day, you can see that water sloshing back and forth. You can see it in rivers sometimes where uh, the water will reverse flow kind of in directions when there's a really strong seiche uh, pushing the water upstream. And I, I've, I've seen that in Manitowoc and the Manitowoc River, uh, two miles from the mouth of the, the river with Lake Michigan, that surface water direction kind of reversing as a really strong sage pushes water upstream. Uh, so that's that's kind of a wind wind driven uh, effect, but we also have uh, what are called meteo tsunamis. Um, so they're not caused by earthquakes like in the ocean, but by very strong pressure. So this is a kind of a simulated uh, say uh, meteo tsunami from the 1950s. Um, where this uh, very strong weather system, and you can kind of see that line of pressure pushing across Lake Michigan and, you know, focus down here on the bottom. So really strong, this is coming out of nowhere. And then down to Chicago, it actually reflects off Michigan, comes back and peaks in the height uh, right here in Chicago. And this was actually an event where, you know, people were enjoying kind of a nice day at the beach. And this uh, this reflection of this meteor tsunami off the other side of the lake, you know, they, they weren't in high waves, but this wave kind of came out of nowhere uh, and actually caused uh, multiple fatalities. So, you know, just kind of the, the scale and the, the power of, of Lake Michigan and the Great Lakes um, kind of evidence right here. So these are, you know, uh, fairly rare events, but uh, definitely more focus. And, and Adam Beckley, who who did this work uh, is, is now a colleague of mine at Wisconsin Sea Grant, and he's our coastal engineering specialist. Ah, and, and so this is, uh, you know, sort of where we're at now in terms of lake level. So if you look, look back to 2020, we actually set monthly record highs uh, from January all the way through August. Um, then water levels started dropping. So there are still, this uh, October 1986 is the record high uh, Lake Michigan water level, um, but we were, you know, we were setting records, and that was definitely uh, impacting, you know, uh, coastal structures. There's a lot of bluff erosion. We had trees just kind of falling off the bluff, houses having to be moved or demolished. 
Uh, but since then, uh, since that August record, uh, there was you know a steady decline, and then this year, really a very small uh, small seasonal increase. Because if you look at this blue line, the dotted line here, uh, this is sort of the annual uh, you know the pattern that you tend to see uh, seasonal water levels kind of low in the winter, increases to a peak in July, and then drops back to the winter lows. Um, so we didn't really have a, a kind of a sustained summer peak this year. And uh, where we're looking, these are kind of the six month predictions, probably drop through the winter and then uh, still above average, but not nearly as, as high, you know, a couple of feet lower than it was up at these record levels. So I think that's probably good news, um, good news for us uh, on the coast. So what is the what does the future have to bring? I think that's uh, you know always something to kind of keep in mind. Future climate is definitely a concern. Uh, you know we are having uh, you know across the state, across the the planet, warming climate uh, that is going to affect the Great Lakes. Uh, you know things like uh, ice ice cover, ice fishing, winter activities in Wisconsin. You know that's kind of a hallmark of our state. Uh, but um, you know we're we're going to probably see shorter shorter ice on season for a lot of these areas. Um, you know there's already trends. Places like uh, the Center for Limnology at UW Madison has been tracking the ice on and the ice off date for Lake Mendota for uh, over a hundred years now. And uh, you know looking at Lake Mendota and other lakes across uh, across the planet, uh, definitely seeing ice forming later in the season and going off earlier. So we're seeing kind of less, less time with ice uh, on lakes. And, you know, biologically that has impacts uh, for us in the Great Lakes. Uh, we tend to have better hatches of lake whitefish and some other species when there's a, a longer uh, ice, ice season. Um, and what we've seen over the last 30 years or so is generally lower ice cover across the Great Lakes. Uh, compared to earlier in that series. Uh, you know, there are exceptions. Uh, I think we all remember the polar vortex from a, a few years ago that really, you know, we had this dip of Arctic weather, really uh, put a lot of ice on. But, uh, you know, if you look at the lakes now, there's, there's very little ice uh, anywhere in the Great Lakes and water temperatures are still pretty warm. Uh, as, as sort of a, a side note there, or at least, uh, you know, another factor, what about new species uh, coming in? So as the water warms, uh, you know, new species might exchange or expand their ranges into the Great Lakes. Uh, invasive species might find it easier to compete with the native species in the Great Lakes. Uh, a lot of our Great Lakes species like lake trout, lake whitefish, uh, the, the bloater chubs, uh, these are cold water species. Um, and so they're gonna kind of probably miss out if, uh, if they have less kind of cold water habitat. Uh, this is a, a picture here from the Illinois River with a boat full of silver and big head carp. Um, you know, you may have heard of those. Those are those invasive carps moving their way uh, towards uh, Lake Michigan. And so that's a concern. Another species we don't wanna let into the Great Lakes. Uh, as of now, they've kind of been stalled uh, for uh, at least 10 years, if not more, maybe closer to 20 years. Uh, in the Illinois River system, uh, there is an electrical barrier there that is set up to keep them from moving closer to the Great Lakes. They're still actually quite a, they're downstream of that still. So they've been kind of stalled for a while. Um, part of the, the management program with that is uh, this commercial harvest uh, of, of these carp um, to kind of take the pressure off. I think part of the, the idea is that you know when populations of these carps get really dense they tend to start moving upstream to find new habitat um, and that hasn't happened so at least some good news there but definitely keeping species new species out of the great lakes is always better than trying to deal with them when they're here um, there's also you know on the positive note though there has been a lot of effort uh, in recent years, uh, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative has really invested a lot of dollars into the Great Lakes on the US side. Uh, you know, lots of targeted effort on areas of concern, uh, places like the Milwaukee Harbor, the Sheboygan Harbor, uh, Duluth Superior Harbor that have these legacy contaminants. Um, the 
uh, PCBs in the Fox River in Green Bay. That cleanup is complete. Um, you know, it, it costs a lot of money, but at least those contaminants have been removed. Um, and that's what the area of concern programs are. They are, you know, these legacy contaminated areas with uh, PAHs and PCBs and other uh, kind of uh, legacy chemicals that are being removed. Um, and so, good focus there. I think uh, there's more focus now on protection and restoration of habitats. Uh, you know, definitely the kind of sustainability is important as well. So, uh, managing sustainable populations of fish and kind of for the sustainability of the future of the Great Lakes. So, uh, you know, with my, my kind of final uh, plug here for the Great Lakes, they're complex, they're complicated, but they're also really amazing. So uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to uh, hopefully learn a few things about the Great Lakes. And I am here to um, answer any questions that you might have.